now, David Ramsey Steele. Come on up, Dave. who may be paying attention. <laughs> I've got a few things to say about progress. I did think of saying progress, but you can't teach an old dog new tricks. And anyway, I calculated that there's only 300 million of you, so it's not really an equal match. And I'm going to beat you into submission, and you'll end up talking like me. So that's my theory. Um, <clears throat> I've had many theories that have been refuted, but uh, I'm sure that won't be. Um, I don't have a, a, a grand theory of progress. I may get round to it one day, but uh, I just have a few elementary remarks about progress. Um, the first thing to understand about progress is that it's an ancient idea. People keep telling you. Oh, just move the mic up a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That, you're you're, is that you're better? Yeah. Yeah. People keep telling you. I keep hearing that. Progress is a new, modern idea, but actually it's an ancient idea. Um, <clears throat> you know, there are various legends that people have uh, some kind of adherence to. Um, some people believe that their Eskimos have a large number of words for snow. That's absolutely false. Um, <clears throat> some people believe that we only use one-tenth of our brains. That's absolutely false. Some people believe that the heart is on the left side of the body. That's absolutely false. If you want to shoot me in the heart, shoot me here. Or, actually, come to think of it, shoot me here. I'll probably <laughs> recover. Um, so people believe all sorts of uh, incorrect legends. And people have uh, legendary beliefs about the ancient world in, in contrast with the modern world. For example, some people believe that a thousand years ago, people thought the earth was flat absolutely false. A thousand years ago, everybody in the European sphere of influence knew that the Earth was round. Um, <clears throat> so, progress. Let me say a few things about progress in the ancient world. There was a guy called Plato who lived in the 4th century BC, uh, end of the 5th century, beginning of the 4th century BC, and he was uh, a big believer in progress. Um, you find his uh, account of progress in several places. A, a book he wrote called Laws, right at the end of his life. It's his longest book, uh, his most mature book, Laws. And book three is devoted to a discussion of progress. Uh, he also wrote about progress in a book called The Protagoras, and also in The Statesman. Those three are the main sources uh, for, his, for Plato's belief in progress. Um, so <clears throat> Plato. Uh, had the idea that there had been many, many cities and civilizations over long periods of time that uh, had come and gone, and they tended to move from primitive to civilized. Uh, and he had, a, a, he had a conjectural theory about how this happened. That first of all, there was just isolated families, then the families got together. Um, and then, uh, eventually, uh, cities and states and laws emerged from this. So he had an evolutionary theory of human society. Um, and he was concerned in book laws to argue that lawmakers, legislators, uh, should not have a fixed law for all time, but should, but should adapt the law to what level of civilization um, they were dealing with, what level of uh, social progress uh, they were dealing with. Um, <clears throat> So if you read Plato and various other uh, Greeks of the 4th century BC about progress, um, cert certain things emerge. First of all, that, that they believe in progress because they've observed it. 
they could see that they knew things that people 100 years ago didn't know. People in the 5th century BC didn't know. Remember, this is BC. So we go from the 5th to the 4th to the 3rd, right, in reverse order. Um, so 4th century Greeks realized that from the writings of people in the 5th century uh, BC, that um, they now knew things that people didn't know then. Uh, and they observed that there was progress in knowledge. Um, you know, my youngest child just did his ACTs prior to going to college, and one of the things he was doing, was, we were talking about this, was um, complex numbers, irrational numbers. You know, well, <clears throat> that was sorted out by the ancient Greeks by the 4th century BCE. That's where all that theory comes from that is now part of elementary math. Um, somebody had to do it, and people commenting on this in the 4th century Greek world said, well, it's about time they got around to doing that. That was their attitude to it. They were not all this, isn't this amazing that you can have the square root of minus one? Uh, it was, they finally got around to that. Now what's next? That was their attitude. So um, you also get the idea that progress is spontaneous. Uh, it, it, it emerges automatically if certain conditions oh, man. exist. Um, it has its own direction. It's not something that can be predicted in advance. It applies to science, mathematics, technology, uh, the arts, philosophy, and it applies to the economy. Now, the Greeks, strangely enough, didn't have a real con concept of the economy, despite the fact that economy is a Greek word. It's made up of two Greek words. Despite that, the ancient Greeks didn't really think about the economy in the way that we do um, since Adam Smith. Um, but they did have an, an idea that some people were more prosperous and better off than others, and sometimes people were more prosperous than they'd been earlier. So in that sense, they thought that economic well-being went together with scientific progress, mathematical progress, philosophical progress, all these things tended to go together. Um, <clears throat> and th they also had the idea that progress uh, occurs because of cumulative effect. We build on what people have done before. We take the theories that other people have manufactured. We look at them, we criticize them, we sometimes discard them. We sometimes improve them, we sometimes add to them. And then people who come after us take up the torch from there. So this, the Greeks in the fourth century BCE understood this. Um, and what is happening now is better than what happened before. Um, <clears throat> now. <clears throat> If you read uh, Book 3 of the Laws by Plato, um, there are some odd things in it, uh, the things that don't make much sense to, to us. Uh, people in the ancient world, the Greek world and the Roman world before Christianity, tended to assume, it wasn't, it wasn't a dogma, it wasn't something they felt they had to, but they tended, it was like a default position they tended to accept, was that the earth and humankind were eternal. They'd always existed in more or less the same form and always would exist. That being the case, it posed the question, why aren't we much more advanced in all these areas? You know, if, if, uh, if human beings have been on this earth just as intelligent as they are now for countless eons, why haven't they figured all this out long ago? Why, do, why are we only now discovering these elementary things like the square root of minus one, uh, or the circumference of the earth, things like that? Um, and the answer they had for that was that periodically there were great disasters that destroyed human, most human life. Um, and one of their favorites was a flood. So you get this odd situation where Plato's discussing this. He says, well, you know, the flood came, it destroyed nearly everybody. The only survivors would be people who lived on mountaintops, and they would be shepherds. And so then they would repopulate, and presumably a few shepherdesses would be necessary as well. Um, and they would be, uh, they would, uh, and then everything would start again. Now it's a bit futile if it, if it has to start again from very primitive conditions. So they allowed, Plato, Aristotle, and various other fourth century writers, they allowed that some of the learning that had been lost was somehow suddenly transferred after the disaster. So 
This is what people thought in, um, in ancient Greece, and they were great believers in progress. Now, uh, you'll, you'll often read in, in books written by people who are paid a lot more than I am, um, that uh, the ancient Greeks believed there was a golden age in the past and, and that everything had been downhill from there, uh, or they believed in a static ideal world that didn't change. Um, well, you know, you have three options. You can believe them, you can believe me, or you can read Plato. Those are your three options. Um, so, um, let me get now just mention four big things that Plato didn't know. And they're relevant to this whole question of progress and also a related idea is retrogression or collapse. What happens when a society collapses or retrogresses? Um, because that has happened many times in history. That a society has reached a certain level of knowledge and economic output, uh, philosophical understanding, and then something has happened and it's collapsed back into a more primitive state. Um, <clears throat> so, one thing about the ancient world is people generally have a very hazy idea of what had happened a few thousand years earlier. Now we know because we've done archaeological digs, all kinds of things, that they didn't know. So the Greeks in this classic period of Greece didn't really know what had happened uh, a few, uh, say 900 years earlier. What had happened 900 years earlier was what we call the, the late Bronze Age collapse. It occurred in the 12th century BC. And um, a lot of people today, uh, they write, move, write books and movies about the Roman Empire and they say, are we going the same way as the Roman Empire because that collapsed? And um, are the Syrian refugees like the, like the barbarians that came into the Roman Empire at the end and picked up the pieces of the Roman Empire, all that kind of thing. Uh, but the, Bronze, the, the late Bronze Age collapse in the 12th century BC is much more applicable to the modern world. Because in Rome, there was just one Rome. As far as the eye could see, it was Rome. Whereas in the late Bronze Age, there were many, uh, well, several uh, nations which traded with one another. Uh, they were separate, independent nations, which sometimes went to war against each other, uh, had diplomatic relations with each other, and, and uh, traded with each other. There were actually nine major kingdoms. There was Egypt, there was um, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, um, and the, the, the Cyprus was a, a separate kingdom. Um, and there were the Mycenaeans and the Minoans. And the Mycenaeans and the Minoans became the Greeks. Uh, now, the collapse happened in the uh, 12th century BCE. And it affected all these societies in different degrees. Only one of the nine political entities survived, and that was Egypt. And all its best days were in the past. The, all the things we think of, like the pyramids or King Tut's tomb and all that sort of stuff, is all prior to this. They never attained their former glory <laughs> after the 12th century collapse. But they did remain um, a surviving political entity. All the other political entities disappeared in different ways. In some cases, they were overrun by new people. Uh, people. People were invading from the sea, from the Mediterranean, and it, they're very mysterious who these were. Uh, but they became the Phoenicians, the Philistines, who gave their name to Palestine, uh, the Jews. Um, all these new groups came in. Uh, and so some of these ethnic groups in the Mideast uh, disappeared and were supplanted by new people. Uh, others, just the, the political order disintegrated, like the Assyrian and Babylonian Empire just disintegrated. The Hittite Empire disintegrated. The Hittites remained for a while as a separate entity, and eventually they were overrun by other people. Um, so you see, what you have here is a real historical collapse. Very, and it's a collapse in a world that's globalized, if you like, like our world is. Um, and why did it happen? Well, there's no agreement on why it happened. Nobody knows why it happened. Um, one theory is that there was an unusually prolonged drought. 
and people love that nowadays because it means climate change, right? So that's very, um, that's very, uh, that's the thing to mention, climate change. Uh, so there was a drought. Uh, there were earthquakes. Uh, there were the invaders from the west. There is some suspicion that there were rebellions, political rebellions in some of these uh, uh, political entities, which was not the sort of thing that would be explicitly mentioned in inscriptions that survive, but you can figure out that maybe some of the fight, fighting that took place and the destruction of population was actually internal rebellion. But anyway, this whole civilization of nine great powers collapsed. And um, that's the beginning, in the, in the Greek world, that's the beginning of the Greek Dark Ages, which ends with Homer writing his stuff, which became the background, the, the, the heritage of all Greeks then, that they looked to Homer. Now, so that, that's, that's, this is all something that Plato, Aristotle didn't know. We know, but they didn't know. Um, second big thing that they didn't know, so, and the point there is, none of this looks like a big flood. Right, that, which is the way they were thinking. The second big thing they didn't know was that uh, we're in an ice age. They were, in, they were in an ice age and we're in an ice age. The same ice age goes on for millions of years. Uh, and there are <clears throat> roughly 10 times as, as many years of glaciation as there are interglacials. Um, <clears throat> so there was the Eemian interglacial, which lasted from 135 years ago to 110 years ago which is much warmer than today, at least five degrees warmer than today, hardly any ice anywhere on the surface of the earth. It was a paradise. Um, and then glaciation set in about 110 years ago and lasted till about 14,000 years ago. Uh, so the growth of a, a new civilization in the period of glaciation was more or less impossible. Uh, and you had to live near the equator or you had to live near the oceans which had a warming effect on some parts of the land mass. But basically, where we are now was under more than a kilometer solid ice. And when this happens again, which it will inevitably in a few thousand years, there will be no Chicago, it will all be ground to dust because it will be beneath more than a kilometer deep of ice. And furthermore, that ice will be moving slowly. Um, so this is the reality uh, we're in an ice age, we're in an interglacial right now, but it can't last much longer, more than a few thousand years longer. And so that's something else that the Greeks didn't know. Um, <clears throat> thirdly, a big thing they didn't know was uh, that humans are descended from different kinds of primates, which we can loosely call apes. They didn't know anything about that. They did, know, they did have a theory of natural selection but it wasn't related to a theory of common descent. Uh, so no, no Greek or Roman thought that humans were descended from apes. Uh, so <clears throat> that takes us back before the e There were humans during the Eemian interglacial. There were three species of humans. Uh, uh, so it takes us back before that, but not too far before that. So, that, so in other words, there hasn't been a huge period the way the Greeks imagined, where there were intelligent human beings on the earth, but capable of creating civilizations. We only had that little window. They could have done it during the Eemian, but there was so much a paradise, you know, um, game was so abundant, uh, you didn't have to grow wheat because the, the, the sort of the meals on hooves would come by all the time, <laughs> just needed a spear to bring it down, and you, you were in the lap of luxury as far as you could see. So you had no incentive to develop some of these other things. So uh, biological evolution, they didn't know about. Um, and the, the fourth thing I think they didn't know about, there was a, like a blind spot, was the uniqueness of the Greeks. They didn't really understand how really strange and odd the Greeks were and how much they accomplished. I mean, the Greeks, uh, you know, Athens was what? I don't know, smaller population than Evanston, I would guess. Uh, and just think of what it did in a short space of time, and that lots of, lots of human communities have been at that level of economic development many times in history, and haven't done anything <coughs> like the Greeks did. So uh, these are four things they didn't know. Now, <clears throat> if you're surprised that the ancients uh, 
knew how to conception of progress. I would say you shouldn't be. Because if you look at it this way, um, something like 7,000 years ago, uh, the Sumerians invented writing. First time anybody had ever written things down. Uh, and immediately started producing a great literature. Great in the sense of huge, I don't know what it is. Um, <clears throat> up there with Lord of the Rings or anything, but uh, um, they produced a lot of, uh, print, uh, a lot of written material. Um, and they had a, a cities where they had all kinds of modern conveniences, um, and, they had, and they were literate. And this was something new under the sun. Uh, and they couldn't help but notice that they were, in many ways, superior to the savage peoples outside the city. I was going to say outside the city walls, but actually I don't think they had walls. But anyway, um, outside their civilization. And they were vaguely aware, in a confused way, that they had come from that condition themselves. So they had to have a theory of progress. Um, that, you know, even though the Sumerians didn't develop as rapidly, knowledge and science didn't develop as rapidly under the Sumerians as it did under the Greeks, uh, they had to know that there had been a progression of stages of historical development because they knew that they were different from their ancestors and different from the people around them. So it's not a surprise at all that progress is fairly obvious and progress isn't something that somebody dreams up because they think it would be nice. It's something that's borne in upon you by observation of what's actually going on. That's, that's why we get, the idea, we get the idea of progress because we get progress, not the other way around. Um, <clears throat> now, <clears throat> in the 4th and 5th centuries, uh, Christianity got a grip on the Roman Empire. Uh, I've left out a bit about the Hellenistic world and so on because I'm trying to save time. Um, and Christianity, <coughs> strange though it may seem, was very much dedicated to a belief in progress. Um, and um, I want to illustrate that, the way that Christianity from its early days was, was uh, was dedicated to a belief in progress uh, by reading something. But before I do that, I would say this. Christianity became a real power in the Roman Empire in the third century and actually took political power in the fourth century. Can I have a menu? And after a, uh, yeah, give me one minute. Take your time. After a period of a few decades, it made it illegal not to be a Christian. <laughs> so that's how Christianity spread. Uh, it's, uh, it spread at, at you know, the point of the sword. Uh, and. Um, this Christianity uh, was a federation of churches. Every, po every population center had its church. Uh, and the church had a boss. The boss was the bishop, episcopus, Greek for overseer. Uh, and the bishop, or well, the boss was either the bishop or the bishop's brother-in-law. So, you know, this was, they, this, this was a, a, a network of oligarchs. And some of these bishops wrote things, wrote books and pamphlets. And they become very became very influential, and we call those the church fathers. There are hundreds of them. Uh, Tertullian and Eusebius and people like this. Um, and they really molded what the Christian church and made the Christian church what it is. The Christian church was made by these church fathers. And their writings continue ever after to be read by the leaders of the Christian church. Now, who were the church fathers? Yes. Who, who were the church fathers? Um, well, they were drawn from the Roman elite. The people who governed the Christian church in the time it came into power and for centuries after, were drawn from the Roman elite. They were elite Roman imperialists. And that, they had to be because they could read and write, first of all. Uh, so right there, that puts them in the top 10% of the population. Uh, if you read the biographies of the Church Fathers, you see that many of them had rich relatives or relatives in uh, local government and so on. Um, 
So, so they conveyed the Roman belief in progress into Christianity. The Christian church was not created by Galilean fishermen. It was created by Roman elitists. Um, and the greatest of these church fathers um, is Augustine of Hippo. Uh, and he wrote a book which is one of the most uh, influential books in the history of Christianity. And it's still, I checked it on Amazon the other day, it still sells hundreds of copies um, every week uh, in several different paperback editions in the United States. Uh, the Kiwitas Day, the city of God. Um, and this is, um, this is in the fifth century. This is Augustine of Hippo. This is, this is a, um, a remarkable passage from this book, The City of God, by Augustine. Has not the genius of man invented and applied countless astonishing arts, partly the result of necessity, partly the result of exuberant invention, so that this vigor of mind, which in, is so active in the discovery not merely of superfluous, but even of dangerous and destructive things, betokens an inexhaustible wealth in the nature which can invent, learn, or employ such arts. What wonderful, one might say stupefying, advances has human industry made in the arts of weaving and building of agriculture and navigation. With what endless variety are designs in pottery, painting, and sculpture produced, and with what skill executed. What wonderful spectacles are, are exhibited in the theaters which those who have not seen them cannot credit. Uh, how skillful the contrivance is for catching, killing, or taming wild beasts, and for the injury of men. Also, how many kinds of poisons, weapons, engines of destruction have been invented, while for the preservation or restoration of health, the appliances and remedies are infinite. To provoke appetite and please the palate, what a variety of seasonings have been concocted to express and gain entrance for thoughts what a multitude and variety of signs there are among which speaking and writing hold the first place what ornaments has eloquence at command to delight the mind what wealth of song is there to capture the ear how many musical instruments and strains of harmony have been devised what skill has been attained in measures and numbers with what sagacity have the movements and connections of the stars being discovered. Who could tell the thought that has been spent upon nature, even though despairing of recounting it in detail, he endeavored only to give a general view of it. In fine, even the defense of errors and misapprehensions, so he's saying here, even the, the, even the mistaken arguments of his opponents, uh, which has illustrated the genius of heretics and philosophers, cannot be sufficiently declared. So you see that in Augustine, we have this uh, amazing adulation of human achievement. Um, and so this is, this is something that was conveyed into Christianity. Now, I must make an important point here. Um, the fact that Christianity had this rhetoric of being in favor of material human progress, which it did, uh, and that this persisted throughout the history of Christianity, um, shouldn't make us think that Christianity was good for progress. Because just as it's true that progress occurs when nobody intends it to and nobody planned it to, so it's true that sometimes by trying to promote progress, you can kill progress or curtail it. And of course, the most extreme example here is communism, uh, as it played out in Soviet Russia where you had an ideology, a belief system, that was strongly dedicated to the pursuit of progress, but actually it held back progress. It put back development of the world by 100 years. Economic, simple economic development was put back by 100 years, let alone anything else. Plus all the great thinkers who were sent to concentration camps and all things like that. I mean, just in purely economic terms, it was a colossal calamity. But it was, com it was commit committed, perpetrated by people who believed in progress. Well, medieval Christianity has a lot in common with uh, Soviet communism, although it's not as bad, I don't think, as Soviet communism. But believing in progress is not the same thing as actually being an aid to progress. I happen to think that if 
Christianity hadn't arisen, and if paganism had continued, scientific and industrial progress would have been much more rapid. We would probably have had an industrial revolution under the Romans. Um, but that's, uh, that's a, a, a hypothetical counterfactual. Um, so, so we have... Uh, now, of course, in all, in all times and places, there are people who have reacted against this uh, recognition of progress and said, oh, things were better in the good old days. Um, but uh, they tend to be in a minority through the Greek period, the Roman period, the Christian medieval period. Uh, now, Rome, the Roman civilization collapsed, definitely economically and technologically. All kinds of knowledge was lost. Some of it was never recovered. How they made cement is no, not known exactly, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, but they did build the aqueduct, as we know from the life of Brian. Um, and um, all kinds of scientific achievements were done under the Greeks and Romans, were lost. But some of them were recovered, partly by the good graces of the Arabs, uh, and were eventually recovered, and then people built upon them. So you have this picture here of collapse, not loss of knowledge, uh, then reco partial recovery, and then using it to forge ahead. Um, now, there have, of course, um, always been the opponents of uh, progress. And I should mention one of the greatest opponents of progress, in my opinion, was Jonathan Swift. Uh, and if you read Gulliver's Travels, it's, um, parts of it are a harangue against the idea of progress, uh, especially in book three. Uh, there's, it's ridiculing science and saying it's that what the scientists do is never going to come to anything useful. Uh, well, of course, it's not the primary goal of science to come to anything useful. But science, in fact, does sometimes <coughs> have useful byproducts. And um, if Jonathan Swift were alive today, I'm sure he would um, uh, appreciate that. Now, in the 18th century, there was a great burst of writers and thinkers who uh, were in favor of progress, praised it, and some of them were uh, were a bit excessive in their praise of progress. And I'm thinking of people like Condorcet, uh, who talked about the perfectibility of man. Uh, but basically, they had, a, a, I think, a, a, a correct vision of the possible future. Um, then you had the doctrine of positivism, which is an early form of socialism developed by someone called Auguste Comte, C-O-M-T-E, founder of positivism, which is a kind of proto-Marxism. It's a Marxism before Marxism. It's a socialist system which has, a philosoph which has philosophical baggage. And Comte, I think, was the first influential writer to start the myth, which some people still fall for, that <coughs> pro the idea of progress was a new idea, that it was a modern idea. Um, so, uh, he, he, so he sort of disseminated that, and his followers tended to disseminate that idea. And they started to, this idea of having contempt for the ancient world, uh, and not realizing how progressive the thought had been in the, in the ancient world. Um, so from the mid-19th century to the mid-20th century, I think a lot of scholarly people, a lot of intellectuals who wrote books and things, believe that progress was a new idea. Um, they didn't get this from reading Plato or from reading Aristotle or anything like that. They just accepted it as a kind of dogma. Um, and uh, one of the great gifts that Adolf Hitler gave to the Anglo-Saxon communities was a man named Ludwig Edelstein. And he came to the United States in 1934, for obvious reasons. Um, and he wrote various things about ancient history. Uh, and he noticed that uh, he was constantly meeting people. Who, and he was a real expert on the, on the classics. Uh, and he noticed that he was constantly meeting uh, American professors who thought that the ancients didn't have an idea of progress. Uh, and so he wrote this book which uh, he died in 1965, it was incomplete, but it was published in 1967. The idea of progress in classical antiquity. I'm going to have the hand, please. Um, and, um, I'm sorry. 
That's where you should go if you, you to begin mean? with, if you want to read about all these ancient Greeks and Romans, Big well, ancient Greeks primarily, so, who believed in progress. You'll find it there. Kind of um, <clears throat> at the end of the uh, 19th century, towards the end of the 19th century, what do you got? There was a, a there were new trends in the thinking of influential writers. And we refer to these new trends as fin de siècle, fin de siècle, French for end of century. And the writers who wrote at the end of the 19th century in French, and this, this happened to coincide with a period where in the English-speaking world, people were beginning to think that Paris was the center of uh, higher thinking, and were beginning to turn to Paris as this beacon to orient themselves. So. <coughs> It was a bit later that Paris started to take women's hemlines, but in the 1890s, Paris began to take the hemlines of intellectuals. Um, and uh, so you have this period where uh, British and American intellectuals start doting on Paris, and fe feeling they had to go to Paris to pick up some of this, and uh, being influenced by these fantasy ideas. Now, um, I recently completed my book on George Orwell, uh, and <clears throat> when I started doing the research into George Orwell, and it's a book about the beliefs of George Orwell, and it's coming out in a couple of months, um, one of the first things I noticed when I started systematically looking at the beliefs of George Orwell is that from a very young man, he had nothing but scorn and contempt for the idea of progress. Uh, and he was, he was sort of bitter, vitriolic in his denunciation of people who believed in progress. Uh, and then, when I started to read more of uh, people writing in English in the 20s and 30s, I realized that this was a very widespread disorder. Uh, it's the same with Aldous Huxley at, at that period. Uh, it's the same with the very influential uh, literary critic, F.R. Leavis, they're all very much against this idea of progress. They're, they're bitterly hostile to it. Um, and um, this influenced Orwell in all kinds of ways, uh, which you can read about in my book. Uh, however, this is how I started getting interested in this whole question of progress, because I realized that this bitter hostility which writers in the English-speaking world had, especially after about 1920, uh, to the idea of progress came from the French fin de siècle. Um, <coughs> and one way you can see this play out is in the way intellectuals viewed H.G. Wells, Herbert George Wells. Thank you. H.G. Wells became very famous with a book called The Time Machine, which was a science fiction book nearly 40 years before the word science fiction had been coined. Um, and he wrote several other books, The War of the Worlds and so on and so forth. Um, and um, he was a great believer in progress. But one of the things you'll notice about those books is they're extremely pessimistic books. Uh, and they're extremely, um, they're extremely conscious of the vulnerability and fragility not just of civilization, but of human life. Um, and when you go into them, you find this is even more true than it appears at first, because, for example, the War of the Worlds, the whole irony of that book is that these creatures who are coming from Mars are what human beings are going to evolve into. We're going to lose the use of our hands, and, we, and so on. We're going to be pitiless. Uh, and we're not gonna, going to have any sympathy for uh, lower orders of life and so on. Uh, he saw that millions of years ahead, human beings were going to, uh, well, he, he didn't have a very good idea of evolution, so he probably thought it would be a few hundred thousand years ahead. Uh, uh, the human beings were going to evolve into these creatures, and these were the creatures who were coming from Mars to our own future was coming to uh, wage war on us. So, despite all that, um, H.G. Wells uh, got a different reputation. 
Uh, what, what, what happened with H.G. Wells was that he wrote these books which are extremely um, pessimistic. The Island of Dr. Moreau was one. Um, and um, they, and they more or less tell you what can go wrong and what can doom us all. We're all doomed, is what you would get from reading these books. Uh, but Wells, of course, was a socialist, a great believer in progress, uh, and he thought there was a way out of this. He thought there was a way to improve hum humankind and, impr and advance civilization and ha have more and more technology and more and more science. Uh, so after a certain point, he started writing books which were more optimistic, depicting what might happen. Uh, so what happened then was that the intelligentsia in the Anglo-Saxon world decided that Wells was nothing but a crude manufacturer of cheap utopias and a completely contemptible popular entertainer. Uh, so after about 1920, up until about 1920, Wells had a strong popular following, but he had a strong following among intellectuals. After about 1920, the fashion among intellectuals was to despise him. The popular readers still read Wells and still thought it was great. Um, but the intellectuals started to despise him. And that's, you can see there, it's the influence of this fantasy for anti-progress thinking. Anybody who's got a good word to say for science or progress is suspect, and someone who's like Wells, who's sort of appeared to some people as a kind of missionary ambassador for science and technology and all the wonderful things it can do, uh, then he becomes the villain. So all these writers, you know, including Orwell and including the young older Suxley and including F.R. Leavis, they all attack Wells and say how bad his influence is. Uh, and it, this, this is part of this transition where, you know, in about the year about 1900, let's say, uh, people in the English-speaking world generally were in favor of progress. But by 1930, they were all against it. And they all thought it was a sign of uh, not being grown up or being uh, foolish uh, to, uh, <clears throat> to, to believe in progress. So, um, these are some of my general thoughts about progress. Now, a few more specific facts. In the past thousand years, population has increased 25 times multiplied 25 times. Uh, income per head has multiplied 15 times. So the average person living on the earth today has 15 times the income of the average person living on the earth a thousand years ago. Um, <clears throat> now we can narrow that down a bit since most of this dramatic improvement has occurred since the early 19th century. We can say that since 1820, world population has increased six times and income per head has increased nine times. Um, so what does this mean? Well, it's one thing it means. In the year 1000, the average life expectancy of a newborn baby was 24. 24 years. That's their average life expectancy. Today, the average life expectancy of a newborn baby of the whole world is 68, and it's going up year by year. Um, and it's not just that the length of life is going up year by year. Uh, active life is going up. In other words, people are not just being kept alive so that they can you know, sit in a nursing home and uh, <laughs> babble and look, stare off into the distance. Act, people are active in their 70s and 80s and 90s in a way that they weren't in, in earlier times. Um, now, one thing that's been happening uh, recently is that fertility has been falling. The number, of, in other words, the number of babies that a woman has in her lifetime, on average, for the whole world, has been falling. Um, the world population is now 7.5 billion, expected to reach 8 billion by 2024, and 9 billion by 2040. Uh, population is growing, but the growth rate has declined and is declining quite steeply. And, and underlying this decline, because of course people are living longer, so that's, that tends to increase the population, 
underlying, uh, underlying this decline in the growth of uh, in the growth rate of population is the falling fertility rate. So the fertility rate in 1970 for the world as a whole was five. The average woman in the world as a whole had five children in uh, 1970. In 2015, it was 2.5, it had been high. <coughs> According to some authorities, the world population will start, stop growing and start falling in the year 2070. That's the figure of the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis. Um, uh, UN figures are, are usually put it further out. They say that it will be in the, in the 20th century uh, before the uh, world population stops rising and starts falling. Because it won't remain static, you can be sure of that. Uh, I'll explain why if anybody wants to know. It's not going to happen. It's, it's going to reach a point and then decline quite rapidly. Um, <clears throat> now, world poverty, by all measures, however you want to measure it, world poverty has been falling rapidly. Um, the World Bank has, is one source of estimates on this, which is quite respectable. Uh, they say that the total amount of poor in the world is halving every 20 years. And they base that on the, the, their poverty uh, line for that is $1.90 a day. Is the, uh, uh, so the equivalent income of $1.90 a day. So the number of people who fall below $1.90 a day um, is, is halving every 20 years. Um, so we're in sight of it being eliminated completely. Um, so the World Bank, in fact, says that um, there were 902 million people who were who were poor, de defined as poor by that measure, in uh, in 2012. Uh, and that's 12.8% um, of the world's population. Uh, and it will uh, decline to 702 million people, or 9.6% of, of the global population this year. So that it means it not only is, not only is, the, is the poor population of the world falling as a percentage of the world's population, it's falling in absolute terms. Um, uh, now, that some poverty persist, persists in um, advanced industrial countries like the United States, and I should mention that since some people may be concerned about that. Um, in 2013, 45 million people were below the U.S. Uh, poverty line. Um, uh, and in 2013, uh, <clears throat> Sorry, in 2014, 45 million people were below the U.S. poverty line. So that's 14.5%. So it fell from 15% in 2012, but it's still higher than before the recession, uh, in uh, pre-recession level of 2007. Um, so um, that sounds pretty bad. Uh, you know, there's um, there's all these people in poverty. Let me just. Let me just mention a few facts uh, that um, these are the numbers, these are the percentages of people below the poverty line in the United States who own various things. Clothes washer, 68.7%. Clothes dryer, 65.3%. Dishwasher, 44.9%. Refrigerator, 97.8%. Microwave, 93.2%. Air conditioning, 83.4%. TV, 96.1%. Video recorder, 83.2%. Computer, 58.2%. Telephone, landline, 54.9%. Cell phone, 80.9%. Those are the percentages of people below the poverty line in the United States who own those things. So one thing we can say um, is that the vast majority of people below the poverty line in the United States are not poor. Uh, we can say that with certainty. Um, so, <clears throat> can, we get a, can we get a better handle on this from some other work? Well, um, <clears throat> there was a study by Eden and Schaefer, June 2013. Um, they calculated that, um, according to the way they looked at it, and I'll say something about this, um, 
1.65 million U.S. households, which is 43% of the total of U.S. households. Uh, Uh, were, were in poverty. Um, so <clears throat> they were in serious poverty, they, they extreme poverty. They, this was their definition of extreme poverty. Um, but that was before uh, food stamps, tax credits, and things like that. And if you make adjustments for those things, it's 613,000 households. Uh, that's 1.6% of the total. Um, so 1.6% of the total households uh, are in extreme poverty by that measure. Um, now one thing they mention briefly in their paper is this, that there may be a lot of underreporting. Uh, underreporting would hap happen for various reasons. Um, one is that uh, a lot of people who are on welfare get uh, illegal income. It may be illegal because if they reported it they wouldn't get welfare or they get less, or it may be illegal because it's from drug running or something, drug dealing or something like that. Um, so, um, and then also when people fill out questionnaires and things, they may not want to mention that they get food stamps and things like that, so there's another kind of uh, motivation. So I think it's fair to say that making reasonable, they say we can't estimate that because we, don't, we just don't know, but I mean if, you, if you've been in contact with a lot of very poor people, you know that these kinds of things are quite prevalent almost a way of life, so to speak. So we can say that there are people in extreme poverty in the United States, but in, fact, in all likelihood it's well below 1%. Now, uh, that's still a problem, of course, but um, it does mean that um, uh, if you compare it historically, uh, things are not as bad as they might seem. Now, I would mention in passing, uh, just without going into it because I haven't got time, uh, this book by Stephen Pinker, The Better Angels of Our Nature. Uh, and this is about the fact that over the long historical haul, violence has declined, uh, homicide has declined. We're not talking here about one decade and the next, we're talking about centuries and millennia. Um, in earlier stages of society, um, uh, tribal societies, uh, ancient societies and so on, people were thousands of times more likely to be killed by an act of homicide than they are today in a modern advanced industrial society. Thousands of times more likely. Um, uh, so it, today, life, even if you live on the south side of Chicago, uh, life is um, amazingly safe by the historical standards. So this is, uh, this is another measure of progress and improvement. I should also mention the research that's been done into happiness or subjective well-being. There's quite a large volume of uh, research that's been done into happiness. Um, um, it has ver various very robust findings. First of all, the great majority of people in the advanced industrial countries are happy. The great majority of people are happy. Secondly, people in rich countries are much happier than people in poor countries. Uh, and uh, happiness rises with income. The more money you have, in real buying terms, of course, not in terms of denomination, nominal. Uh, the more money you have, the happier you are. Uh, now, there is, uh, there is a declining return. So, in other words, if, you, if you're making 20,000 a year and you go to 30,000 a year, you get an income. You are going to be happy. If you get another 10,000 raise and you go to 40,000 a year, you're going to be happier again. But you're not going to be as much happier as you were from the first 10,000. Right? So, there is, so the, there's a declining uh, amount of happiness with each increment in income, but there is, this is one of the most robust findings in this happiness research, uh, is that uh, income rises with happiness. Industrial societies, people are much happier than in pre-industrial societies. Um, so um, this is a, these are all relevant to the, the whole question of um, uh, progress. Uh, so I was going to conclude by um, talking about threats to further progress uh, and uh, itemizing what they are and how serious they are. But um, uh, since... Um, Can you do it within about five minutes or so? I'm doing five minutes, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, um, <laughs>
Well, there are various things that threaten to stop progress, and they could. And, uh, one of the myths about progress is that people who believe in progress think it's inevitable. Exactly the reverse is true. The more you believe in progress, the more you're concerned about how fragile it is and how it could fail at some point. So believing in progress doesn't mean you think there's anything inevitable about it. Um, one idea is that we can't keep on improving things. We can't keep on, and part of this is related to the misunderstanding of economic growth. You get people who say, we can't keep on growing because the earth is finite. Um, and this is a sort of an elementary error which needs to be debunked. Uh, because economic growth does not mean more and more bulk. It means more and more value. And more and more can value can take the form work. of smaller bulk, or even of eliminating bulk altogether. Um, you know, um, a vinyl record has got a certain weight, a certain bulk, it takes up space, it has to be moved around. Um, a fire, a, my access to Spotify, uh, where I can listen to millions of possible vinyl records or DVDs or whatever, CDs, um, takes up no, almost no space at all. So the, the whole idea that the Earth is going to burst its bounds with economic progress because, because uh, there are limits is wrong. There are no limits because we're not adding bulk, we're adding value. And you can add value by uh, reducing the size, as well as by increasing the size. Uh, so that's, that's one thing to dispose of. Now, obviously, there are various threats. I mean, one threat, obviously, is a major war. Um, there could be a major war, uh, and, that, and that might set back progress, although, it's very interesting to notice that the Second World War wasn't as de devastating to progress as people feared it might be. Uh, you know, H.G. Wells made a movie called Things to Come where he showed what would happen after the bombing of London. And it had millions of people in a disordered, demented frame of mind wandering, wandering the roads. Uh, that didn't happen. People could take bombing. <laughs> and uh, maybe people can take chemical weapons and... Uh, and uh, germ warfare as well, I don't know. But anyway, so uh, it's a serious threat. We ought to avoid war if we can. Um, I, I do have some ideas on how to avoid war, but I've only got five minutes here. Okay, thanks, um, David. Uh, plague is another possibility. We could have a, a, a world plague that wipes out. Um, and now there are billions of people in the world. They're constantly meeting each other. People are going from one side of the world to another in a plane. They can spread the infection in no time. Uh, and meanwhile, the effectiveness of antibiotics is declining rapidly. As we're running out of antibiotics effectively because the uh, various microorganisms are becoming immune to these antibiotics. So there is that danger. Possibility of plague might wipe out lots of people. Uh, natural disasters, well, an asteroid might hit the Earth uh, and it might wipe out um, human life. Um, our best chance might be to shoot it down. Uh, if we do shoot it down, then, um, and prevent the Earth being wiped out, then thank you, Ronald Reagan, for keeping the Strategic Defense Initiative going. Um, so, um, <coughs> now, in three and three quarter billion years, three and three quarter billion years from today, the Sun will have expanded so that it basically swallows up the Earth. Um, and uh, so that is it. And that's a long way off. And the good thing about that, of course, is that at that point, solar energy will become economically viable. Uh -huh. <laughs> that was a joke. Um, <laughs> now, now, our galaxy, the Milky Way, is due to collide with the Andromeda galaxy. But there's a lot of empty space in galaxies. And anyway, that isn't going to happen for four billion years' time, by which time we'll all be burnt to a crisp by the sun anyway if we stay on this planet. Climate change, well, of course, you know what I think about that. Uh, the, what the climate change we have to worry about is the new glaciation. We're slipping into a new glaciation. Winter is coming. Um, we can hope that it won't come for several thousand years. But, of course, it, uh, generally speaking, if you look at uh, interglacials and glaciations in the past, the onset of a glaciation is more gradual than the ending of the glaciation. Uh, so, but more gradual could still mean a, a sharp drop in temperature at some point, which would mean, uh, that could mean starvation, 
if the output of grain is hit by this cool, cooler weather. So at all costs, we must do everything we can to avoid cooling, uh, <coughs> which could be the onset of the new glaciation and lead to starvation. Um, however, if we, if we have enough, if we have any luck, then uh, the, the world's pop human population is going to start falling in 2070. Uh, and if it falls far enough, we could even come through the glaciation. Because remember, the tropics don't change much in interglacials and glaciation. It's the, it's the poles and the temperate zones that change. Uh, um, so uh, there's, there's just room for fewer people and room to grow things for fewer people. Uh, so we may be able to work this out if we can reduce the, <coughs> the population goes down perhaps soon enough. Uh, we can there's some hope there, uh, but ultimately I would say our best chance is if we're interested in the survival of the human species uh, is um, to diversify our location by being in favour of space exploration, uh, so that we can um, move into other parts of the galaxy uh, and. Um, uh, so that if one or two points get wiped out, there'll still be others. So that's my uh, that's my optimistic conclusion. Okay, Andy, let's get questions going here. Thank you, David. Yes. Okay. Start point now, people. Who's got a question? Right here. Yes. I take it that Wells' reputation did not change for the better among intellectuals even after he published his nonfiction books like The Outline of History or uh, Science of Life. Right, well, his first important nonfiction book was a book that most people haven't heard of today. And in its time, it was a bestseller. It was called Anticipations. Anticipations of the effect of uh, science and technology on something or something. Long, long Victorian title, and he, that was published in 1901. Uh, and that was what, you know, up till then he'd written these science fiction books, then he published that, and they became like the Marshall McLuhan of his time, like the pundit about technology. Uh, and then also, of course, he started writing these wonderful novels that are not science fiction at all, like Kipps and the History of Mr. Polly, just great novels. Uh, but then he started writing uh, books about how it might all change for the better and we might have a glorious future. And they're, from a literary point of view, they're not, from an artistic point of view, they're not so good. Uh, there's sort of clunky discussion of ideas. Um, and um, uh, yeah, the outline of history was, um, well, I suppose, you know, it did what the internet does today. You know, it's the people who don't have a lot of resources, don't go to university, and so on and so forth. They can, it's a way of getting some facts. Um, and um, yeah, so the outline of history was a huge sell. Uh, and then he wrote uh, um, a book about biology. Science of life. He wrote Science of life. And then he wrote this stupid book about uh, economics that he knew nothing about called The, the Work, Wealth, and Happiness of Man Mankind. It's absolutely dreadful. Uh, if you want, uh, there's no one who's written a worse book about economics, except perhaps Thorstein Veblen who probably is the champion of writing bad books about economics. But, but Wells didn't know anything, didn't know about the down, down and sloping demand curve, anything at all. Uh, and that book is terrible. Uh, but it's, it's full of socialist propaganda, so it, that was widely read at the time. Uh, so he, he did all that. But yeah, the, the, the intellectuals, uh, they were quite snooty about Wells yeah. in 1920. Um, OK. I think uh, what's over here, Andy. Uh, what about uh, computers and progress? You don't have to think anymore. A computer will think for you. Right. By persistent thinking. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, well, I mean, I, I think people will think, but of course, uh, computers will take up, will do some of the drudgery of thinking, and they can think about the more important things. Uh, so I don't see that as a, a bad thing that computers can do a lot of stuff. Okay. Next question. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, you said that uh, things will get could get very very tough, uh, but uh, in the not too distant future, 
won't there be a uh, big need for uh, for an increased number of people to populate Mars and other outposts that we would have established? We seem to be going headlong in that direction, and that we might um, uh, set up stations on the moon and then uh, further on to Mars and so on, so that in two and a half billion years or whatever, when uh, the sun goes out or what have you, we would have probably populated many planets and the Earth would be like an antique that might not be needed anymore. Well, it's the optimistic view, I hope so, yeah. Um, I mean, you know, long before three and three quarter billion years when the sun has expanded to swallow up the Earth, uh, the, 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 presumably the Ice Age will come to an end. The succession of interglacials and glaciations will come to an end at some point. I don't know if this has been calculated. Uh, but the, 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 you see, for the entirety of the Earth's existence, the sun has been getting steadily warmer, but very, very slowly. Um, and that happens because helium is, is uh, opaque and doesn't let the heat out. So as it converts hydrogen to helium, it bottles it up more. Um, so, um, you know, there is this... Um, so, that, so basically, we can expect it in very, it taking a very, a very long haul, like uh, like a hundred million years. You can expect it to start getting gradually warm. Um, it, something less than that. It's basically, if you if you were sort of flick a switch and go into the future, uh, a few million years into the future, you're probably going to end. You're probably going to land in a period of glaciation, so it's going to be <coughs> terribly uh, bleak and cold. Um, but if, but it, you know, um, the, presumably the succession of, of glaciations and, and interglacials will come to an end, and that basically it will be warmer, um, and uh, eventually you'll reach a point where uh, there is no ice and snow anywhere on the Earth. Um, but that will be, you know, that will be hundreds of millions of years ahead. So, <coughs> But yeah, you're right. I mean, uh, if we can get off the Earth and colonize um, Mars and other places like that, that would be good. Okay. Charlie. Yeah, David, am I correct that it would be a good idea then to burn all the fossil fuels, dirty fuel, fuels that we could get to... Uh, Bring, uh, uh, slow down this glaciation, and until the pack hit the few remaining people left on Earth can huddle around the equator. So we should be burning as much fossil fuels as we can find. Is this would, would that be a good idea? I knew you'd come around, Charlie. I always thought you'd come around. Um, yeah, I mean, look. Um, the reason we burn so many fossil, like the, the reason we burn so many fossil fuels is mainly because the Greens conducted a successful campaign against nuclear power. We ought to be using much more nuclear power. Jimmy, I mean, basically, uh, nuclear power is the cheapest and the safest, and in many ways the best. But it's also inflexible. It doesn't respond well to changes in demand. So what you want is something like 80% of of power production should be nuclear, and the rest should be fossil fuels to to take care of that of those fluctuations. So that's what, that's what I would say. I mean, the effect of the effect of the minuscule amount of carbon dioxide that's being added to the atmosphere is not going to be detectable in terms of the world. If it was, I'd say let's pump more and more of just for the sake of it. I said many years ago, you know, let's let's do it, but it's not worth, it's not worth doing it with that motive because the effect the effect is so slight. Somebody has you a question here. Okay. Over here. Go ahead. Uh, I got confused when you talked about uh, happiness. Was that one title, uh, uh, the better, uh, the better angels of our nature? Was that about happiness? No, that's a different thing. Oh, okay. No, I, mean, I mean, he does mention it. It's, uh, this is quite, a, as you can see, it's quite a fat book. Stephen Pinker is fond of fat books. Um, he's got a lot of thoughts, uh, but he, but he's mainly to just document, documenting the tremendous decline in violence 
ah. in human, uh, human affairs over the long term, how much less violence there is today than there used to be thousands of years ago, and even hundreds of years ago. Um, no, the, um, the happiness literature. Um, there's a man called Ed Diener. Ed is his first name, Diener, D-I-E-N-E-R. Um, and um, appropriately, appropriately enough, he's the dean of this happiness uh, research. Um, he's, um, he's one of the leading names in it. And uh, um, he, uh, there's, a, there's a collection of, of uh, foundational articles called, um, it's by Dina and Sue, S-U-H. Um, and it's something like Culture and Human Well-Being is the title. Uh, and that's, you, you can read a, a lot of different uh, approaches to happiness in different countries, how they measure happiness and so on and so forth. Um, and, um, but but uh, there is a big, you know, it, it, a growing field, and it would probably be more of a growing field since it's so interesting, but it has one drawback, and that is, and this is a, this is the thing about the, our culture, that its its conclusions are so are so uh, are so um, welcome, you know, are so are so upbeat that people don't like it, you know, they want to hear the bad news. There's a huge huge appetite for bad news. Um, so uh, the, the fact that uh, the great majority of people are happy, especially in advanced industrial countries, you know. If you look at the countries with the highest levels of happiness, like Denmark, Sweden, Switzerland, those countries, um, and then the U.S. is a little bit below that, and then the U.K. is a little bit below that. But then, but you know, basically, the advanced industrial countries are bunched up in the happiest area um, <coughs> uh, of the graph. Um, you know, um, but we're with what we're dealing with here is millions of people living happier lives than large numbers of people have ever lived in the whole of human history. That's what we're dealing with here. Uh, and uh, that's remarkably something that we ought to feel good about. But of course, anything like this is, um, it, it, it doesn't, it, it's difficult to sell because people want to hear the bad news. Yeah. If they'd found that people were more miserable um, <clears throat> in advanced industrial societies, we'd be hearing about it every day. In fact, we do hear about it every day, and it's not true. Um, all the research points in the opposite direction. Uh, and if we, especially if we can find that rich people are, are not happy, but of course rich people are happy. <laughs> and the richer, the happier. <laughs> we're, getting toward, we're getting toward the rebuttal period, so got about five more minutes for questions, then we'll start rebuttal. Okay. Uh, In the back? Go ahead. If uh, the universal consensus amongst the scientific community around climate change is wrong, your position is right, find out in the future that, in fact, you miscalculated and you might be wrong, what's your <coughs> contingency plan, what's your backup plan for the community you live in? Well, what do you, what do you, think, the, what do you think the consensus is? I think the consensus is that uh, human activity is causing our planet to and that we should do something immediately on par with the World War II mobilization. For well, renewable well I mean, uh, unlivable, I mean, it's, it's, there is a view that, um, that, if you, that increasing the, the amount of uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere raises global temperatures. Um, so far, this has not been borne out in Peru. Um, but that's, that's, a, that's a prediction of what might happen. Now, um, how much would, uh, would what, percent, what percentage of increase, how many degrees Celsius would the, uh, the global mean surface temperature have to rise before the climate would become unlivable? Supposing it, supposing, it, supposing it went up by One. five degrees, which is far more than anybody is projecting, seriously, <coughs> uh, that would mean we were like it, it would be like it was in the Eemian. Um, where humans thrived, in fact, where an important part of human evolution took place. So, I mean, it would be very inconvenient for people who have coastal properties and so on. On the other hand, it would be very convenient for people who live in Canada and Siberia, uh, oh, yeah. who would suddenly have useless land turned into useful land. 
um, and luxurious growth of, uh, of tropical plants there, there and so on. So, um, so it would be a mixed deal from, from the point of view of individuals, but it wouldn't make life unlivable. And nobody suggests that, um, that increased CO2 is going to raise um, the global mean surface temperature by 15 degrees or anything like that. That, that, would, be, uh, no, that would just be laughed at uh, by everybody. So, uh, so it's, uh, there's partly, partly a question of what you think is likely to happen, uh, and partly a question of how bad you think it would be if that happened. Um, I mean, what we do know, what we do know is this, uh, and it's not universal, there are plenty of dissenters in the climate science community, and I can talk to you for hours about them and what they say. Uh, but um, <clears throat> what we do know is this, all the predictions that have been made uh, about the future of climate have, by these people, by the IPC and the hangers out, have been false. Everyone, when it's, the time has come to test it, they've all been too hot. Um, <coughs> you know, that, um, uh, and this goes back to Hansen, 1988, when he said, gave these three scenarios, and we're nowhere, it's nowhere near as hot as the, as the best of his three scenarios today. Uh, and there's no sign it's moving in that direction. Not, none whatsoever. So, you see, what this comes down to is a, is a simple issue, actually, simple, a simple conceptual issue. Um, <clears throat> climate sensitivity. Um, how sensitive is, is, uh, the temp is the global temperature to an increase, a doubling of CO2? Uh, and if you double it and then double it again, it's, it's like a logarithm. The doubling at the second time is not four times the, the starting point, it's only twice the starting point, because it's like a logarithm. And eventually it, it ceases to have any increased effect, because those resonances, those wavelengths are all blocked out. Uh, so that, that will be reached pretty soon. So, um, so the question is, is climate sensitivity high or is it low? Uh, so I'm, I'm just saying that the results keep coming in on that question. It's, it, it's an empirical question. The results keep coming in. Climate sensitivity is low. Go ahead. Back there. Dave, uh, thanks for your uh, presentation. It was excellent. Uh, it might be a question with a philosophical effect. What do you think is uh, currently like the prime mover of progress? Like need, like necessity, food, water, safety, economic, nationalism, global uh, uh, companies? What's What's driving progress right now? What do you believe is driving our society for progress? Because you know, I remember when I was a kid, it was in, I mean, I mean, it was a wonderment, like in the night, early 1970s when we got a microwave. Yeah. I mean, holy mackerel, that was that was a big deal. You know, I mean, I, I, that that was a jump. That was progress. That, that that was an amazing thing to me. And you know, the cell phones. I mean, I'm sure we could rattle off a bunch of different things. What do you think drives it now? Well, I'm not sure there's a single thing. I think that there's a, um, certain things have come together. One is um, scientific knowledge. Uh, the other is a comparatively free market, and enough to permit entrepreneurship and people to uh, innovate and make money innovating. Um, and so, I mean, I think the progress required, the preconditions of progress. So you're saying, you're saying like that there's somebody identifies a need and then the free market steps in and creates. Right. I mean, the, the, I mean the, the, the reduction in world, in world poverty has not been accomplished by the UN and it's not been accomplished by charitable agencies. I mean, they may have, uh, maybe, may, let's be generous and say that maybe 5% of it has been accomplished by governments and, and private charities. Right. It's been accomplished by private business going in pursuit of profit. Um, uh, where the conditions permitted it. You know, there was a time in China where conditions didn't permit it, and then Deng Xiaoping, bless his heart, <laughs> um, permitted a lot of uh, free market um, operations to occur uh, under government scrutiny and so on, but still it was enough and it, it took off from there. Okay, why don't we get a speaker?
Okay. Is Mr. Speaker, again, we're going to rebuttal. Is, is it's it getting short? It's a little early. No, it's not early. It's close to eight o'clock, Charlie. If you gave everybody four minutes, we're going to be pushing the time we get out of here. It's about three minutes, State. Why don't we let? Why don't we finish up with this question? You had part of the question you still wanted to ask. I think he had a little bit. Did you get a decent answer? No, I always we always usually get at least two questions. Well, we don't have time tonight, Charlie. We got to start earlier. Look at the time. We have to go to rebuttals. Okay. Because they want us out of here at quarter to nine. All right. Yeah. Let's thank our speaker again for David Ramsey Steele. <laughs> thank you, David. Who, who wants to uh, get the microphone? We're in the back rebuttal room. period now. Uh, Can you rewrap that thing around the around the thing? Yeah. You're talking about the uh, yeah. Velcro. Yeah, the Velcro. I, I'm afraid it might good. be. Huh? Everybody raise their hand that wants to give a rebuttal, and we'll see how much time we have for each person. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, that's five minutes for everybody with eight minutes. Eight rebuttals, five minutes apiece. We'll go. We should. We should shoot for four because shoot there for might be four more. If you can. Uh, uh, thank. It just. It just. I'm afraid it might fall. <laughs> we got to reset this thing after tonight. Hold on. Okay. Okay. Who's first? All right. I think. Uh, Bernie. No. You're up. You're up, and we'll, you got a timer, Randy? Yeah. Okay. You ready? Let's go ahead and rebut. Okay, uh, thanks much for the speaker. I uh, always enjoy his talks. Uh, I come here to hear uh, things I don't agree with, rather than things I agree with. I agree with, with some of what he said, but I do want to mention a few things. One is when he talked about uh, how happy people are, the little part, uh, it's interesting that the uh, some of the countries he mentioned were the were the Nordic countries where the uh, climate seems to be lousy, but they're all capitalistic countries, but with a lot of control. That's something uh, you might think about a little bit. I do want to mention one book that was mentioned here by Robert Holland. I don't know if any of you remember Robert Holland, but uh, he, uh, there was a book, Why America Failed by Morris Berman, uh, which is, uh, if anything, uh, a lot different uh, from what the, the speaker has to say. Also, another one that probably a half a dozen people in the room remember, Collapsed by Jared Diamond. Those books would be a uh, interesting uh, 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 foil to uh, what the speaker said. Thank you. Gene, brother Gene. Oh, boy, man. Give it, give it, listen. Let the propaganda run. You're a rebel, rebel, Gene. Printed in Moscow. Yeah. 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 See it, touch it, feel it, enjoy it. You know, I don't know if anybody saw the Bill Murray Mark Twain Award, but he did pass his award around. Uh, yeah. I think I'm going to take your suggestion and have everybody pass the award around. All right, when a gigantic wealth redistribution occurs, funneling trillions of dollars from working class communities up to the one percenters. And wealthy, powerful, warped, twisted-minded people almost completely dominate public policy on Earth. And then have the gall to call for more, more, more. It's for a very clear reason. Uh, they don't view Earth uh, like you or I do. They don't view life on Earth the same. Uh, they don't see Earth as a fragile biosphere that's orbiting the sun, which seven billion people call home. Uh, they see it as a monopoly board with resources on it to make annual earnings. And, um, you know, we're just all part of the scenery. The land, the air, the sea. It's to put a flag on. So some rich guy can get richer, 
some oligarch can take the status of God, and some extinctionist can take the status of super God. It's interesting that uh, you picked legends to begin your talk, because when you mention Ronald Reagan's strategic defense initiative, I can think of no greater legend ever in my lifetime. Uh, that's definitely a legend, Hall of Famer. The more happy, or more money we have, the happier you are. False. If you take a poll of the people of the earth, and I haven't done this, but I would love to have the opportunity to do so, uh, the more happier we are as a result of how much more peace is on earth, more equality, more democracy, more transparency, more justice, and more protection of the natural environment. Um, money are pieces of green paper that are like lifeboats because it's so bad on earth as a result of failure of leadership we all know we need money because we need a really good lifeboat not because it makes us happier because we're desperate to survive neoliberalism Um, something else was mentioned about George Orwell, how he had a scorn and a contempt for progress, I believe he said ever since a young age. George Orwell had a contempt for totalitarianism and hypocrisy of people in power whose job it is to know better and to reflect our values, not their own. So when you get the sense that Orwell's patience is at an end, that's what happens when you're a freedom fighter fighting for social justice and you see kings and chancellors and presidents and supreme leaders acting like they're God. We're at three minutes right now. Don't so. hold back, Jonathan. Don't hold back. Don't hold back. Don't hold back. Don't hold back. I've been writing this thing called Who Knows Their Stuff. Here's some people I feel uh, have the leadership skills but don't have the money. Go ahead. Family farmers. Climate change scientists. Environmentalists. Renewable energy workers. Steel mill workers. Construction workers. Engineers, infrastructure workers, nurses, nurses assistants, physicians, journalists, streets and sanitation workers, recycling workers, teachers, veterans, social workers, human rights advocates, independent living center workers, senior center workers, electricians, carpenters, plumbers, mechanics, shoemakers, utility maintenance workers, textile workers, seamstresses, librarians, historians, Independent bookstore owners, newsstand workers, printing press owners, copy store owners, physicists, chemists, researchers, pilots, captains, drivers, navigators, firefighter workers, <coughs> peace officers, human rights lawyers, tailors, grassroots organizers, nonprofit workers and volunteers, parks workers, chefs, kitchen workers, servers, bussers, dishwashers, social media workers, painters, artists, musicians, gardeners, documentary filmmakers, faith organizations, and small business workers. Baseball players do. Okay. Um, I don't put ecociders and propagandists and profiteers and overseers and lobbyists on that list, because uh, I think history is proving what they know about. Thank you very much. My name is Dennis Nelson. My rebuttal is based upon Mr. Steele's write-up, which appears on the college website and in the schedule handed out this evening. And uh, yes, Charlie, uh, with my experience and knowledge, I did schedule my rebuttal presentation on December 17th based upon that and also upon what I've heard, uh, heard this evening. On November 18th, 1992, under the auspices of the Union of Concerned Scientists, the World Scientist Warning to Humanity was released. This quote from that warning is a call for action to change our stewardship toward the earth and the life on it. Quote, a new ethic is required, a new attitude toward discharging our responsibility for caring for ourselves and for the earth. We must recognize its fragility. We must no longer allow it to be ravaged. This ethic must motivate a great movement convince reluctant leaders and reluctant governments and reluctant peoples to effect the needed changes, unquote. The World Scientist Warning to Humanity was signed by over 1,500 members of the national, regional, and international uh, science academies from 69 nations. The signatories included the majority of the Nobel laureates in the sciences. 
That was in November 1992. Let's fast forward to the present. Here in November 2016, which is 24 years later, that warning is even more, re more relevant, compelling, and urgent. A majority of the scientific community still backs it. Thank you for your presentation, Mr. Steele, although I couldn't disagree with you more, and I'm particularly referring to uh, the last part of it. I've spent literally thousands of hours in researching, writing, speaking, and organizing around actually solving the dimensions of our environmental, energy, resource, population, climate crisis in order to make our planet more livable and equitable. I reject the cornucopian fantasy of abandoning the Earth and living in space colonies a la physicist Gerard O'Neill, mining the asteroid belt and building large solar power satellite stations as impractical and necessary yeah. and too expensive from an economic and energy standpoint. Uh, Mr. Steele, I've already responded to the basic premise in your write-up and the conclusion of your presentation with contrasting ecological worldviews of the Neo-Malthusians versus the Cornucopians, are the Earth's resources finite or are there no limits to growth? That was my Earth Day weekend presentation this year here at the college. I showed that the right-wing libertarian think tank such as the Heartland Institute here in Chicago, Cato Institute, and American Enterprise Institute have been gung-ho in attacking sound environmental science our environmental laws, and the environmental movement with their junk science and junk values. You and I obviously disagree about what the word progress means. What the environmental movement has done is to provide a constructive and sorely needed redefinition of progress. Two slogans come to mind. Progress as if survival mattered from Friends of the Earth, and not blind opposition to progress, but opposition to blind progress from the Sierra Club. An indefinite expansion of the human enterprise with a limited economic, population, energy, and technological growth is simply impossible within our essentially finite system powered by the sun with real ecological and geophysical limits. A classic example of a needed technological renunciation. During my high school years in the early 1970s, I had a role in helping to defeat the proposed American Supersonic Transport, SSD. The environmental movement beat the Nixon Agnew administration, the aerospace industry, and the aerospace unions by stopping a planned fleet of 500 American SSTs for sound ecological and economic reasons. Oh, by the way, the British-French Concorde SST is the biggest uh, fuel-guzzling aeronautical lemon ever constructed. So I have a little extra time. Again, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Steele. The first part of his presentation was interesting from a humanities perspective. And I'm well read in science fiction, and I'm a fan of science fiction movies, and I've enjoyed uh, like War of the Worlds and like The Time Machine by H.G. Uh, Wells, and I've enjoyed the, the movies that have been made based on those two novels. Uh, thank you very much. And, and, and see, and see everybody here in December 17th. There it is. Looking forward to it, brother. Bravo. Encore. You better get back up for a second time. Oh, my name is Raj Patel. <laughs> my, my mind is actually an election and <laughs> not into other topics. And uh, I think as Carl Wien was a good break and it was a good therapy to feeling good. The last last uh, two, three weeks we've been uh, struggling with a 80 plus year old lady who the foot got infected and uh, there was a question of uh, chopping up her leg. And, uh, and uh, for, for some strange reason, me and my godson, we are the only people who are a uh, guardian because she has, no, she has nobody. And uh, this Paul came in our lab to decide to what to do. And we fought and uh, we are still, we told the doctors and that uh, as long as far as possible, whatever can be done to spare our legs, we want that. But uh, this is the issue. And it's not just progress. But progress for whom? And progress how? What kind of situation? People get people are lonely, lonely, lonely. When they need a help, they do not have a help. They need 
they may soldiers cry on, they do not have technology. I am for technology. I believe in technology. They were not some good. But ultimately, we have to make technology, those people who are the owners and drivers of technology, responsible and cognizant of what, what average America or average person on earth, they are up to, they are into. What are their problems? Where do they go? And if I cannot understand technology, my, my Medicare thing, almost impossible to understand for me. Okay, that, that what it is, and I'm pretty well educated, I'm pretty well knowledgeable. Okay, if you have a thing, we are, we are so, lots of people. I have, a, I have a few biology PhDs, I was talk, I was talked last summer. And there was something, what they say, after doing PhD, they realize that there are no jobs, no credible jobs, and no progress possible in their lines. Because it's a ultimately financial give and take for companies and organization and employment. And it's not there. Okay? You know, I have a friend of mine who took three years after working very hard in technology, being a very smart guy, he took three years break in India. He came back. Do you know? He cannot get a job. For three years, things have moved on. He's nobody. See, these are the reality. And, uh, and I understand all the history and everything and climate change and everything. <coughs> but reality is day-to-day -day living from every person. You know? And it's, our church has broken down. They are not there. Real in reality. Our society has broken down. We do not know. We, we, we might have a, lots of wealth. Do you know something? Today you need a help. My, my mother died in India uh, three, months, uh, three months back. And do you know what we have a problem in India of all the places? We could not get, get somebody to take care of her at home. Just taking care means lifting up to clean her toilet. She cannot move last, last, last one month. Or, or they would take her a sponge her. Because my, my brother, they are, my, his wife, they are 70 years old and they cannot lift her to do all those things. But we could not find a person. And in America, in America, in America, here, in America, we cannot find a person, you know, because everybody, everybody wants to be big. Then there are no niggers. I mean, you know what I mean, I mean, you know, I didn't black my mean, there are no lower class people to help any middle class people. And middle class people are the worst. They're, they're, I, I see a couple, a man in last winter, man was falling down on a, 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 in a snow, was falling down at a bus stop, and his wife was trying to wake up and he could not stand up. And they did not have money to go by cab. Or hospital did not deliver them. I mean, these are the realities. Let, let, let us worry about solving a real problem. Let us think how to be human. And do you know, it's going to be tough. It's not going to be easy to solve this problem. It had to be a global perspective. It had to be a social perspective. It, it's going to, it's going, to go, go to places we don't want to go. Like, uh, my time is up? 30 seconds. Okay. We, we, we will have to go there where people have a right to make a baby. People have, people have a right to die if they decide to. How long, how much medical we can, very can, we can afford them. Okay. Who's going to take care of them. Okay. And all these questions has to be discussed. And, and it had nothing to do about history. It has to do everything now. And if technology runs away, nobody understands technology. We cannot understand. And still we have to use it. Only thing we can understand is use, but not how it works. We are in trouble. Thank you. Okay. Good evening, everyone. I'm David Travis. Uh, if you go back just about 30 years ago, if a man lost his, a man or a woman lost their legs in uh, Vietnam or in an industrial accident or whatever, they were basically doomed to being in a wheelchair for the rest of their life. But science and technology has brought us to a point that these people not only walk, they play baseball, basketball, and they're able to do all kinds of things. Uh, recently, I've been seeing a commercial on television for the Shriners Hospital, and uh, they show a little boy who was born with no arms. 
And I'm sure that before too much longer, we're going to have artificial arms that a boy like this can have so that he can function like any other human being. And that that won't last too long. It'll be kind of like the, uh, kind of like the, the uh, fax machines that came in and were quickly made obsolete because we will find ways through stem cell technology and so forth for a little boy like that to actually grow the arms that he needs. So uh, I have great uh, respect for technology and for medicine. And as we go along, we're going to do better and better. And as a species called humanity, I think we're going to do great things, even if we don't travel to other planets. But I do believe we will. Uh, I want to say that the biggest danger to all of it, and I'm going to mention something that David Steele brought up about the uh, Roman Empire. When Rome collapsed, a whole new age was ushered in. And that was called the Dark Ages. And we lived in misery for a long, for about a thousand years. And it wasn't until about the late 1400s that we began to poke our noses out of that and start to get involved in, uh, again, in science and technology. And mankind sort of saw that as our real hope. And uh, Martin Luther wrote his small catechism, Columbus brought us the new world, and uh, uh, Gutenberg invented the printing press, and so on and so forth. So that with science, and then England went into the uh, Industrial Revolution, and uh, the United America emerged as the United States, and uh, science and technology were looked on as the saving grace of humanity. We even, when Thomas Edison was a little boy, uh, if he had an idea, people would suggest that he was in league with the devil. We didn't come out of the Dark Ages overnight, even when we began to have our ages of technology. It was a slow climb. And uh, I would say that by the time Edison died, we were at a time where science and technology was pretty well universally recognized. But I want to tell you that the biggest threat to all of it are these third world terrorists who would like nothing more than to sneak into Grand Central Station in New York and put a suitcase nuclear bomb that would take out half of the, of the city and spread fallout that would cause uh, terrible repercussions. They would like nothing better than to do this in New York, Chicago, LA, and a number of places to take the United States down. And if the United States did go down, uh, we are the leader of the world in terms of science and technology. So if the United States went, that could literally usher us into a new dark ages. And yeah. I think we need to be very careful of that sort of thing. Thank you very much for letting me talk. David. Yeah, yeah, boy, David. David. You see, in, in a book called Superfuel by a gentleman by the name of Richard Martin, he talks about the complex societies and what it takes to power them. His main premise was that because of the abundance of slave labor, there was no need for Rome to develop things like steam power. And they were very close. They had the cog wheels, they had the gears, and there was a toy in the first century. It was a little ball that could roll when it was around a steam thing, but nobody had the idea to really you know, put it into popular use, even though the knowledge and some of the engineering was widely known. 
it was still a large reliance on slave labor that kind of eventually brought Rome down. They had to go further and further to get their crops to maintain their lifestyles. They had to go up further and further to maintain their empire and their bureaucracy. And a lot of that, what I personally believe, he makes a lot of sense, is that Rome decayed in a rather slow track. If you look at the gentleman Herodotus, who made a trip in the later stages of Rome, Rome was known for its roads, but in his short 75-year lifetime, they had degraded a little bit over, over time to where travel by sea became much more applicable. The thing that we have to realize about our progress is that we have a large reliance on cheap, elect on cheap energy, mainly in the form of electricity. And as we know, once people get fundamental access to electric power, their lives change dramatically. You're no longer going, for example, a woman washing clothes. She now has a washing machine rather than having to go to a stream. A farmer can stay up at night and study when he has electric light. Our advanced industrial economy uses a lot of power. And there have been a lot of great advances, but in a sense, what we've done is replaced that slave labor that Rome had with carbon being our slave. And we have the further potential in the form of some nuclear power, as Dave Steele alluded to, in the form of nuclear power right now is done not in the most or best or efficient way. It's the light water reactor that's basically a naval submarine invention just been scaled up and we haven't really done any fundamental research in this field since the 1960s. I know many of you scorn when I mention the word thorium molten salt reactors, but I honestly think that I, well, Charlie, that's because of a flawed design, and I don't want to, let's, let's not get that. That's just a little, little flaw. What I'm simply saying is this. Once we perfect this technology, and as Richard Martin says, this revolution is ultimately going to happen because of the advantages of the power source. We did the fundamental research in the 60s, and it was abandoned by the Nixon administration. And we're just now starting to rediscover that lost art of the molten salt reactor. Now, I personally think that renewables will have a place in our advanced economy. And what David Steele has talked about is widely shared by myself, particularly, and other widely spread authors, particularly Richard Freeman in a, in a book called the next 100 years. I honestly believe that the main reason we're losing population and reducing it is for one fundamental reason. Kids, when you get prosperous, are no longer a source of labor. They're expensive to raise. They cost right now about a quarter to a half a million dollars each for a family to raise over a lifetime, and that's an expense. You're going to want one or two of them, but not five, six, or seven, as you would over time. My vision of the future and about progress rests heavily on the fact that maybe whether you agree or disagree with climate change, we do know that fossil fuels do pollute the air. We do know that fossil fuels uh, are not the best way to make electric power, nor is coal. But the point is, is that there's been more, and just since 2011 alone, especially with the rise of the Chinese nuclear industry, there's been more research dollars poured into this field than we have had before. I want to thank David again for a good presentation and give you some food for thought on what you should, on how we're going to power our advanced industrial future. Thank you. I wanted to thank David. Thank you. That was a very yes. compelling, uh, <laughs> very compelling uh, speech. This isn't a rebuttal. This is uh, this is a very thought-provoking evening, and I just right. want to bring up a couple of points. Number one, uh, and perhaps we can talk about this later. I'm wondering if the pessimism brought about in the 1920s was, was was as a result of the horrors of the First World War. People 
people saw technology, you know, uh, when they looked at technology, they saw machine guns and artillery and, and, and mass murder on, on, a, industrial on, scale. on an industrial Quite scale that, that they've never seen before. And, it, you know, and that frightened people. So technology was to be feared and abhorred. I'm just, I'm just, it's just something to think about. Gentlemen that brought up the Dark Ages, uh, raise your hand, right please. Here. Very good point, but you know, and I, I have to be honest, I'm, I'm, I'm 52 years old. Uh, a lot of my knowledge of world history, I, I haven't cracked a textbook since college, 25, right. 30 years, okay? Uh, my, my interests have laid in other places, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm ashamed to say that, but what, what were the Asian and the Arabic societies doing in those times? I, I seem to recall that those were not necessarily dark ages uh, uh, for the Arabs and the, and the Japanese and the Chinese. I think they made it tremendous advances. While we in the, in, in, in the westernized and the European world were, were, were living in squalor. Uh, we're talking about colonizing other planets. Uh, yeah, I'm, I got mixed feelings. Uh, I understand what Charlie and this other gentlemen are saying. It's, it, it would be, they're saying it's too prohibitively expensive to branch out into space. It, it, it's much more, it makes much more sense being stewards of our Earth and conserving what we have uh, rather than poisoning it versus branching out. I'm, I, I got mixed feelings about that. I, th I think inevitably we're going to have to go. Uh, if you guys are interested, there's a there's a trilogy of books. They're, they're science fiction books, but they're absolutely fascinating. I probably read them 15 or 20 years ago by an author, Kim Stanley Robinson. Ooh. Red Mars, Green Mars, and Blue Mars. And, it, and, it, and it's, a, it's, an op, it's an optimistic and pessimistic look uh, at the colonization of mankind. Because these people start out as colonists, as human beings, eventually they, they and, and they, through advances in technology and medicine, they become, they're able to live several hundred years, they develop new technologies, new way of living, uh, they, they terraform the planet. Then they identify themselves as Martians, and eventually they go to war with Earth. So ultimately, our, 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 our baser nature takes over. Uh, and then finally, Mr. Patel, that was very compelling. You're saying that technology is dividing us. And in a lot of ways it is, because we're all, we all have our heads in our iPads and in our computers and on our cell phones, and we don't care about it each other anymore. And it's terrible. I don't have an answer for it. You're talking about that fellow that fell down and nobody would help him up? The truth of the matter is, people that are good Samaritans now get sued now. People are living in fear. We're all living in fear. We're all living in fear of being on Facebook, YouTube, ending up in court. It, it's horrible. It's, it's not, not even 20 or 30 years ago, you'd be willing to help your neighbor out. Now, you just want to Pull in your driveway, get in your house, and turn your TV on, and forget everybody else. You want to tune everybody else out. Everybody's got their own narrow into self-interest now. You're not a world community anymore. And that's heartbreaking. Right? You know, I don't have an answer. So, thanks, you guys. All right, Don. Yeah, boy, Don. Thank you, 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 Don. Got, got First of all, I'd like to thank our speaker for giving a tremendous presentation. He, he brilliantly illustrated several things, classic things that I've been talking about in my speeches for the last uh, 15, 20 years. And one of the things I wrestle with is when someone is standing in a blizzard of evidence, scientific evidence and they claim they can't see a single snowflake what is the proper response from us do I ask are you uninformed on the basic science after you've been claimed to have been studying it for 15 years or is somebody paying you to stand here and lie to my face falsehoods another thing is what do we say to a person who gives a, a presentation where they actually believe something that's not real that's mythology the, the very idea that the human race could get energy and, and save itself using nuclear power is as far out of touch with reality and the human language that you can be. Uh, nuclear power is the greatest energy disaster the world has ever seen, and at today's prices, solar energy costs 
uh, less than 20 percent per kilowatt of output uh, yeah. overall. Solar energy is a fifth the cost of any new nuclear plant, thorium or otherwise. Right? Yes. This book, Merchants of Doubt, is describes the tobacco strategy. When the answer is overwhelming, the science is overwhelming, and there's no debate on it anymore, then certain people are paid to produce lies and to create doubt, and then they're picked up by other speakers who present it to the population as if this is a, a credible opinion or output when there's no credibility at all. Uh, David Ray Griffin's book, Unprecedented, Can Civilization Survive the CO2 Crisis, is a summary of probably a hundred books on climate change, global warming, and a call to action right now. We have pictures from the satellite. Of, well, there's pictures of uh, a cruise ship that is, you know, that is sailing through the North Pole now where the ice used to be. There's pictures of mountaintops that used to have ski resorts all over the world. There's no snow. The, the water in the uh, Arctic in the north is warming up because it absorbs light. For the last 11 months, they're reporting that each month has set a record for the hottest <coughs> year on a global scale since we've been keeping records. There is no debate at all in the scientific community that fossil fuel burning is related to climate change over the last 150 years, 200 years. There's just no debate on this, and yet we have people that are doing exactly what Naomi Oreskes and Eric M. Conway talk about. They're paid to produce doubt, to slow down any congressional action that would cut into the profits of billionaire predators. One final thought, couple. When a company says, I'm sorry all your children are dying because they can't afford the medicine, uh, but I need my billions. Now, I know that bottle of medicine used to cost $10, but I raised it to 500 because I want more billions. Yeah. That's not greed. We have to use proper language. That not, that's not greed. That's somebody with psychopathic tendencies, a mental illness. Yeah. And if you let these people rise to the top and become billionaires, they will eat up and kill everything in sight. The U.S. military today, believe it or not, considers climate change, catastrophic climate change, as the number one threat facing humanity. But the people running the military industrial complex are still using our military to take over countries that are oil rich in the guise of, quote, hunting for Osama. Uh, it's 15th year anniversary. Uh, the U.S. military, with 800 bases around the world, is considered the largest polluter on the planet. It's the largest environmental destroyer on the planet. It's the largest killing machine on the planet. And that whole thing is being driven by the hoax and fairy tale and myth of 9-11. You puncture that myth and look at the new studies coming out about the lawyers, they're preparing the papers to arrest the top 30 people that orchestrated 9-11 and take them to the International Criminal Court to be prosecuted for international war crimes. And those top 30 start with Bush, Cheney, Rumsfeld, Rice. The Bush administration created, orchestrated 9-11 and has used it to as General Clark said, we're going to take down seven countries in five years and reorganize the Middle East. If we're going to have a peaceful, green future, we have to face the reality of what these things are, rather than living under the illusion that some of these opinions that have been long debunked and outdated still have credibility. Thank you. Andy, boy, Andy, Andy, make it happen. All right. Now we got David here. All right, we'll make it quick because we, we only have the best time I for can. Eight. I'm the best I can. I agree with most of what you've said, and I thank you for a stimulating talk. I find that your ideas, even if I don't always agree with them, and I often don't, nevertheless, are, are certainly are stimulating. However, uh, with regard to progress, some people think it's an end of itself, and I don't know that it is. People talk about progress sometimes just for the sake of making progress. It has to lead somewhere positive. And you sounded like a 1950s television commercial during part of what you were saying, as with, for example, DuPont, better things for better living through chemistry. Um, and you also spoke of happiness well, in the manner of Charles Schultz, one of the first books I read when I was 
old enough to read on my own was Happiness is a Warm Puppy. Yeah. All right. Um, <laughs> and I would also like to send a message to the gentleman who marched here with the sign, through here with the sign. <laughs> I would say to him, no, you shouldn't always butt out and come in. Sometimes they're good. They sometimes they have accumulated knowledge that you won't be able to get elsewhere. What I do say is, vote out all Republicans all the time. <laughs> halfway there, you're halfway there. And I speak as a lifelong Democrat. And voted Libertarians. A lifelong Democrat. No, I don't have much use for them either. And I speak as a lifelong Democrat. And a, and a believer in vote early and vote often. Yeah, baby. I'm not a believer in, 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 uh, in these folks who are complaining about rigged elections. This is Chicago and Cook County. We've looked at that for years. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's have a day. Very nice uh, presentation here. I'll be eclectic and quick. Uh, not, a, not every change in complication <coughs> is necessarily progress. And the other thing is that uh, progress is not linear. It can, in fact, uh, take different directions. In fact, it can head backwards. Uh, one other thing I'd like to add here, uh, is you got into the history, is during the Middle Ages, there was absolutely denial of all such things as change or progress altogether. They thought there was stasis. They, each year was identical to the coming year, and the only thing that would happen is the final coming of Christ and so forth in, in scriptures. But each year was identical. Nobody even kept track of one year to another numerically. Uh, progress is often identified as, in, generally to most people, as an improved standard of living. Uh, usually it's come to mean the standard of living for the 1%, the super rich, unfortunately. Uh, he talked there about the 5%. The government can only take care of poverty for the 5%. I was reading yesterday, as a matter of fact today, about how free market capitalism takes care of poverty. It was a sweatshop in which there was a girl who was nine years old and she was a manager, a supervisor, over the other employees of the sweatshop. Skill talent, my Yeah, yeah, I mean, this, we've got a nine-year-old in charge of the workforce. The rest of the workforce, is, of course, is younger. Uh, increased standards of living need complex levels of organization. And the one thing we've got to look at is what it has really taken historically, which amazingly you didn't cover. In the past two to three centuries, there's been rap rapid industrialization, extraction, and use of fuels, fossil fuels in particular. It's, um, it's some blame. Oh, look at the energy that's used. The, the furniture that to create the furniture and get it here within this room and and what took place to get the energy used I'm in mean, transportation it's amazing that I, I just read a figure today there are 35,000 diesel engines operating in the United States burning fossil fuels every day do you think that has no effect and then I come here and I go well the road solution to this is that we have to we we have to move to another planet. Um, well, I don't know about that whatsoever. But anyhow, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Let's go live in the asteroid belt. Yeah, we'll see you in December. Yeah. yeah. You're We're trying paid. to say something. You're paid. Paid. Hey, attention, people. Yo, help the guys who are trying to clean up here. So move your stuff to the edge of the table and let them come in. Or we got to get out of here in about okay, five minutes. Get our head we got time. Time. Final statements for you. Final statements. Okay. Read my notes here. Um, oh yes, um, I, I, there's a number of points were made, and I'll just deal with them as they occur to me. Um, somebody made the point that the happiest societies like Denmark and so on uh, are not laissez-faire societies; they have government controls, and that's true. Uh, although it is true that um, 
the level of government involvement in the economy has been measured to be about the same in Denmark and the United States. So, um, for what it's worth. Uh, somebody talked about the transfer of wealth to the top 1%. Well, he obviously didn't listen to my exposition in defense of the 1% that I gave here a year or two ago. It's like, you can see it on YouTube, and that will disabuse you of some of your misconceptions. Um, uh, somebody denied that um, uh, if, you, if you get more money, you're happier. I mean, it's not the money itself that makes you happy, unless you're a miser. It's the things you can buy with the money, and money is just a means to an end. Um, and uh, it's greater well-being, greater real income that, that uh, leads to more happiness. And it would be strange if it didn't, um, since we all want uh, greater real income. Uh, it would be weird if, in fact, um, we were always disappointed and never, uh, never got any enjoyment out of it. Um, the tendency to, uh, for, for the people who believe in uh, global warming, to um, deny that there is any debate or deny that scientists criticize their theories. But this is just uh, incorrect. You just, I could, you know, we can have a debate about this sometime. But I can cite uh, hundreds of scientists who uh, criticize this view. And I furthermore, I have predicted that uh, in the next six or seven years, um, the whole global warming um, delusion will be over. And you'll see this, uh, you'll, you'll see this play out. And it's very similar to many, um, many uh, such delusions that have played out. And one of them, of course, is the, the whole idea of a low-fat diet and that you can give yourself heart disease by eating fat. You know, that, that used to be uh, preached by all the uh, people said that everybody believed, and of course they didn't. Uh, but now it's been generally abandoned. Um, <clears throat> so a new dark ages if the US falls. Well. Um, I mean, one thing here I think is very important is that in ancient times, records were very fragile, written records, because there was no printing. Um, and um, if it's papyrus, it just it tends to uh, disintegrate. Um, and uh, so the great majority of records just disappear over time. Uh, so the, if a society collapses today, then at least there will be printed records, and not to mention microfilm and... and uh, uh, electronic uh, records, so that um, there's more durability to the records of knowledge. So there is a greater chance of recovering it accurately and rebuilding, um, and getting more. You know, if you do rebuild, you've got more a, a, a bigger treasure trove of past experience and past knowledge to draw upon. Um, <clears throat> uh, the the idea that the pessimism is due to World War One. This is an interesting thing. I mean. In terms of philosophers writing, it came earlier. It came in the 1880s and 1890s. Um, it's true that, 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 that there was a lot of pessimism associated with, with World War I, but I think that's like, oh yeah, this is just what we mean. You know, uh, people, um, uh, like every time there's a heat wave, the global warming people say, you see, the Earth's, world's coming to an end. In the same way when World War I came, and it was a very particularly horrible war, people said, oh, you see what we mean? Uh, this is the end of progress, uh, or this is where progress leads. Um, the, the whole theory that 9-11 was, uh, was conducted by the Bush administration in order to accomplish something, uh, to me doesn't make much sense. I can't see what they were trying to accomplish. Uh, certainly, uh, the, the invasion of Iraq was a fiasco and didn't get them what they wanted, at least unless you have a particularly devious mind. It just seems like a huge uh, succession of blunders. Um, so um, I'll just say this about finally about the, um, the Middle Ages where Charlie said they didn't keep track of time. Actually, they kept track of time very closely. The, the Middle Ages was a period of steadily increasing mechanization and industrialization. And uh, um, when they changed the calendar to the Gregorian calendar, there were riots because people thought they were losing several days of their lives. So that shows how closely they kept track. Uh, they kept track of time in the Middle Ages. All right. Give them a shout, Andy. Okay, that concludes this meeting for tonight. So all of you have a safe trip home. Thank you. All right.